Our next speaker is Professor de Vaud. She focuses on computational biomechanics as a tool for personalized medicine. Together with PhD student Sarah Vermees, she will present us her research topics. Hi, welcome to join us on this talk. During this presentation, we will give you an idea and an introduction to our research on organ perfusion and drug delivery. And um, so I am Charlotte Debout, but during this talk, you will also meet uh, one of our PhD students, who is Saar Vermees. Now, if you look at our research group, um, our group is called Biomeda. And with this group, we belong both to EBTech and to Engineering for Health. Now, you could wonder where Biomeda stands for. And this becomes more clear on this slide. So Biomeda, it actually represents biofluid tissue and solid mechanics for medical applications. So here you get already a general idea of the type of topics that we study within our group, but this will become much more clear during uh, the rest of this presentation. And if you look at the location where we are located, uh, so here you see a nice view of uh, one side of the skyline of Ghent. And if you look a bit closer to number 10, there you see one of the buildings of uh, the University Hospital in Ghent. And so that's also the campus on which we are located, more specifically in, uh, in building block B at the fifth floor. And this location at the University Hospital is actually very helpful for us because we often collaborate closely with uh, doctors at the hospital. So that only facilitates uh, those type of uh, collaborations. If we then look a little bit more broad to how the well, how we fit in Ghent University, then here you see a schematic overview. Uh, so basically within Ghent University, we belong to the Faculty of Engineering and uh, Architecture. And then within the faculty, we have the Department of Electronics and Information Systems. And within that department, um, we have the Institute of Biomedical Technology in which we really focus on biomedical engineering applications. And at this moment, we have two groups belonging to EBTech. So one is uh, our group, Biomeda, and the other group is our, uh, our colleagues from Medisip. And with both groups, so in fact, with uh, the Complete Institute of Biomedical Technology, we also, since recently, we belong to a newly uh, developed institute called Engineering for Health. And if we look at Engineering for Health, as you can see right here, so you see the, the bubble scheme at the left. Um, let me see if I can also put on my pointer. Um, that would be helpful. Yes. OK, great. So here we have EBTech. Uh, so and within EBTech, we have on one hand Biomeda and on the other hand, we have Medisip. Uh, so these are our colleagues who focus more on medical imaging and also signal processing. And they also have the lab Infinity, uh, which is a very interesting facility also located at uh, UZ Ghent, where you can do all kinds of small, Im small animal uh, imaging. But if you then look at the broader scope of Engineering for Health, you see that we also have a partner on board called BEAM. And I guess that some of you uh, might know BEAM quite well or are maybe even a part of BEAM. But BEAM is a student association of the biomedical engineering students at uh, UGENT. And then on the other hand, we have also MedTech, which represents our partner related to uh, medical technology um, and uh, valorization and links with the industry in the area of Ghent. So the aim of uh, Engineering for Health is really to be an institute that brings together a community of people uh, who have a, a similar mindset or a similar purpose, and that is to look into how can we accelerate medical technology and also innovation um, at the level of medical devices. So uh, recently, we also started a, a LinkedIn page with Engineering for Health. So if you would be interested, please feel free to have a look at uh, this link. Um, and uh, if you want to follow us, uh, feel free to, uh, to do that using that link. 
Okay, but then let's go back to Biomeda, which is our research group. And uh, first of all, I would like to introduce you to the people um, who we work with within Biomeda. So in fact, our group counts four principal investigators. Uh, we have Professor Patrick Seges, who is uh, leading our research group and uh, who is mainly focusing on cardiovascular medicine uh, applications. Then we also have Professor Pascal Verdonk, who is uh, more focusing on medtech uh, valorization, links with industry. Um, we have uh, Anne Geisels, who is focusing more on molecular modeling. And then uh, there's me, uh, Charlotte Devote, uh, and I'm mainly focusing on organ perfusion and biofluid uh, mechanics. We also have two visiting professors within the group, Professor Malcolm Forward and Nele van Mai. And uh, so we have several collaborations uh, together with them. Malcolm is also um, attached to UGent and uh, UZGent, while Nele um, is also uh, linked to KU Leuven for her main appointment. And both of them, so we collaborate with them, but we also have some courses that we run together with them, so in which they also um, facilitate part of the teaching. Then we have a few postdocs within the group. And we also have, of course, our PhD students who make up the largest part of the group. And as you can see on this figure, we have about 22 PhD students in our group at the moment. And then what we do. Uh, so here I want to give you a little bit of a background on what we do within the group. And then afterwards, we will focus a bit more on the topics that I am uh, working on. So within our research group Biomeda, we very often start our research starting from a clinically relevant research question. And the goal of that question can be a multitude of things. It can be to, to try to better understand a certain disease or a certain physiological phenomena. Um, can be to quantify how an organ works or a system works uh, in order to better understand how it works, but then also how it might uh, not function well anymore in case of disease. It can also be very helpful to look at treatments. Uh, how can we improve treatments? Um, and in that sense, even medical devices might come into play uh, where we typically look at design or how we can improve the design of certain medical devices. So to do that, we um, really look at the mechanical aspects and typically my focus is more on the fluid mechanics and transport processes that play a role in these research goals. And to investigate these things, we typically uh, use a combination of, of several methods. And uh, one of our main methods that we use within the group is really computer modeling. Uh, so that means uh, fluid mechanics modeling that we call it CFD, but it can also be finite element analysis or even fluid structure interactions. But then having models is really nice, but you also have to be able to show that what your models predict is realistic. And to do that, we often need also experimental work in order to validate our models or to provide input to our models. Um, so experimental work that can be um, ex vivo, in vitro, but we also sometimes use uh, in vivo data, which can even be data coming from uh, patients. And here you see an overview figure of the types of um, research that we focus on. So it really ranges from going from cardiovascular mechanics over molecular modeling up to multiphysics modeling. Eh? And here you see a few examples of these research topics. Uh, so for instance, for cardiovascular mechanics here, you see an example of a fluid structure interaction of the blood flow through the aortic arch. Then below here, an example of a medical device. So in fact, what you see here is a geometry of a patient with uh, a triple A, which is an abdominal aortic aneurysm. And here we look at how a stent graft is deployed within um, that geometry. Now here we have another example. This is a, a simulation of um, ultrasound images at the level of the carotid arteries. And in fact, it's here we are looking at a bifurcation. 
Then here you see an example of molecular modeling. Uh, one of the topics that is studied here is, for instance, the permeability through certain membranes. We also look at tissue biomechanics. So here you see an example of how growth and remodeling at the level of the heart can be studied. And then the last topic mentioned here about artificial organs and biofluid dynamics. The example that you see right here is an example of a um, design of a bioartificial liver system where uh, computational modeling is used to see if that can um, help in improving the design. So this is just a quick tour uh, around in our group and the type of topics that we focus on. I just gave you a few small examples, but feel free to have a look at our website because there you find lots more information about uh, much more topics that we are focusing on. Um, actually, we recently did the exercise of updating our website, so uh, please feel free to visit that one if you want to have a bit more information. Now, if you go back at uh, looking at this figure showing the different research topics within our group, my main focus is really here on artificial organs or just organs and biofluid dynamics. And this is also, um, well, the area in which uh, I was linking to this research area um, during well, the, the prior parts of my career. Uh, because here, if you look at uh, my career at Ghent University, you see, of course, I first did my bachelor's and my master's. And during my master thesis, um, I already got really triggered by um, this biomedical engineering research and more specifically looking at organs or artificial organs, because there I was I was looking into um, yeah, liver transplantation and how to better preserve donor organs. I will also come back to that later when we talk about organ perfusion. And then actually I started my PhD in that same topic. So I, I did my PhD on, on that um, liver perfusion modeling. Then I started a postdoc and during that postdoc several new projects um, were started. I was able to start new projects and then I was happy to uh, to be able to start as a part-time professor from 2015 onwards. And then from 2019 onwards, I had the pleasure to become a full-time professor in uh, numerical biomechanics at UGent. You see that there are also some um, periods that are colored light blue in this timeline. And those were a few uh, well uh, breaks, career breaks that I had because of mater maternity leaves. And uh, my three kids were uh, born at that time. And during my career, I also had the pleasure to meet uh, well, lots of international colleagues. And in fact, during my PhD, I also spent a fellowship in um, for a few months in Canada, in Toronto. So working at the University of Toronto, but also the, the Sick Kids Hospital. And I must say that that was also a very interesting and uh, a nice experience. Now, going back at my uh, task at this moment, at uh, being a professor, in fact, your tasks are um, kind of distributed amongst three main areas, as you can see right here. So the main task is, of course, research, but there's also a very important task of education. Uh, so regarding the research, I will give you more uh, introduction about the topics I'm working on in the next couple of slides. And regarding education, I'm mainly involved in, um, in both the bachelor and the master programs that we have in biomedical engineering at UGent. And in fact, the master program is even uh, an inter-university program between UGent and uh, VUB. So there I'm involved in, in several courses uh, teaching uh, to the students. Then regarding services, uh, that's our third task. Yeah, that can be really a multitude of things ranging from uh, internal services within UGent, uh, being member of certain commissions, uh, PhD juries and so on, but also external services um, for like for society, um, the broad society or for scientific community, uh, for instance, being a reviewer for uh, journals. But what uh, we also do is organizing events, uh, info days. Um, we also often organize workshops, STEM workshops, um, in which we aim to um, have secondary school pupils uh, pupils visiting our lab and then we uh, introduce them to biomedical engineering uh, by doing some nice workshops together with them and the idea there is, is also to um, to try to awaken this enthusiasm um, 
with girls and to also go into more technical directions like uh, engineering or biomedical engineering. Okay, but for the rest of the presentation, we will focus more on the research topics. Eh? And regarding research, I will introduce you to um, some of our topics. So first, we'll have a look at organ perfusion. Then we'll have a look at uh, drug delivery and cancer treatment. And during that part, um, you will also meet Saar Vermees, who will introduce her work on uh, partial nephrectomy planning. And then we will conclude with just a few examples of uh, other projects. But let's start with our work on organ perfusion. So this was mainly the work that was done during my PhD. And it really started from um, the idea of the problems, let's say, the challenges that we are facing with in uh, liver transplantation. Um, and in fact, the problem is even more broad than that because the general one of the challenges is that the need for transplantation organs is typically larger than the amount of organs that are available. Uh, that's also what is being illustrated right here in these papers. So the question is really, is there a way in which we can enlarge the donor pool or that we can try to, to help these patients? Uh? Because if you look at their numbers, uh, for instance, here you see a graph of uh, Eurotransplant showing the uh, number of patients that unfortunately die while being on the waiting list for liver transplantation, you see these numbers over time, they are luckily decreasing a bit, but still uh, about 400 people a day, uh, a year, I'm sorry, for about 400 people a year are dying while waiting for a liver transplant. So of course, it would be much better if we can um, help these patients also uh, before they, they reach that stage, of course. So uh, during my PhD, we had a look into how we can optimize um, alternative transplantation techniques that might help to, to, uh, to solve this, this problem. Uh, and one of the ways that we looked into this was how we can maybe use um, extended criteria donors. This means that you would also start using um, donor organs with uh, a lower quality. Uh, for instance, organs coming from um, donation after cardiac death or for coming from people who have a fatty liver, which we call liver steatosis, or even um, yeah, very old donors um, from which donor organs might still be used. And we know that these slightly lower quality donor organs might have um, some issues during preservation so that we should be very careful with them. And therefore, we started looking into an alternative preservation technique. Uh, so normally, donor organs are uh, transported and preserved between resection from the donor and implantation in the receptor by um, packing them at a very low temperature, uh, packing basically yeah, packing them in a sterile way and transporting them on ice. But here we try to look at a dynamic way of uh, preserving them by connecting them to a perfusion machine, which you can see right here. And so see, here you see a liver connected to a pumping uh, machine, and this uh, enables you to send a certain perfusion fluid through the organ. So you're kind of mimicking um, what happens with the organ in the body. Uh, of course, here in this specific um, application, we use a perfusion fluid instead of blood, and we were working at low temperatures between, let's say, 4 and 8 degrees Celsius. But research is evolving and, and they're even looking at this moment at uh, normal thermic perfusion, which is basically um, perfusing the organ with blood, albeit hypernized, um, but doing it at normal body temperatures, which of course brings uh, extra challenges. So this is one way to try to uh, preserve these donor organs with a lower quality in a better way so that they are still viable for transplantation. Another way of um, enlarging the donor pool is to look into what we call living donor liver transplantation. And that means that a healthy individual, uh, for instance, like me or maybe you, um, would offer part of his or her liver to a patient with liver failure. Of course, there has to be a match in that case. But then the thing is that part of the liver is removed, can be 60%, for instance. Um, but we know that there is still a risk eh, because the remaining part of the liver might be uh, too small for, for the individual donating part of his liver. 
as well as for the recipient who receives part of the liver, there is a risk that the part of the liver that he or she receives is not sufficiently large. Now, the thing is that the liver has a very unique capacity of regeneration. So um, normally, if this procedure is done in a, in a good way, the liver will regenerate and regrow to a full liver over time, over well, typically a few months. Um, but if the remaining part of the liver is too small, you might end up with a liver failure or well, first you'll end up with a small for size syndrome and then you might um, run into major problems of, uh, of liver failure. Yeah? So to better understand all of this, we uh, focused on um, modeling hepatic perfusion, so the flow through the liver basically, um, in support of these transplantation strategies. And one way uh, that we did that was really by looking at the blood vessels of the liver, trying to quantify them at different levels, and then based on that, build models of the hemodynamics. And so here you see an example of uh, how we looked at the larger blood vessels of the liver, and then we looked at a sample coming out of this part to look at smaller vessels, and then eventually we even looked at the microvessels being the smallest vessels of the liver called uh, the sinusoids. So basically here you see uh, the technique of vascular corrosion casting in which we started this work. So we started from uh, human lippers that were discarded for transplantation. And this was done in close collaboration with uh, KU Leuven also. So we basically injected these livers with um, a resin and also adding a contrast agent to the hepatic arterial side. So that's here the red blood vessels that you see. Those are the hepatic arteries going inside the liver. Um, here in blue, you see the second uh, blood entry into the liver, which is called the portal vein. And then basically these two types of blood vessels, they really spread and branch throughout the liver until they meet each other, basically at the level of the liver microcirculation. At that level also the liver functions typically happen and there can be communication with the uh, liver cells and then after that blood is drained again through the hepatic venous system until it leaves here into the inferior vena cava. So here you see two examples of, of vascular replicas. So what basically happens once you have injected the resin in the liver is that it will polymerize so it will harden and then the last step is to put that liver with uh, basically the plastic inside in a bath of uh, potassium hydroxide and then all the tissue is removed. And what you are left with is this. So here, as you can see, these two replicas, which is basically just plastic representing uh, the vascular structures of the liver. And then we did uh, micro CT scanning of these livers to get very detailed images of the blood vessels. And uh, so we used the resolution of 110 micrometers to do this. And then we segmented these images. So basically, uh, as you can see here, that means you really look at the regions of interest. So in red, you see the arteries, in blue, the portal veins, and in purple, the hepatic veins. And then you can make 3D reconstructions out of that using image processing software to further analyze the geometries. Uh, so here you see a movie just turning around this um, reconstruction of the blood vessels in the liver, which is a quite complex structure to, um, to investigate. Uh. It's really fascinating to, to look at these blood vessels and how they morpholo morphologically um, behave or branch throughout the complete liver. And then based on these images, we started to do a very detailed analysis of the morphologi morphological uh, parameters of these blood vessels. I will not go into detail, but here you just see an example for the hepatic arteries and how the radius will drop as you go further and deeper inside the liver. And then using all of that information, uh, all these morphological characteristics that we obtained based on these livers, we fed that into what we call an electrical analog model of a human liver. And the principle be behind this type of modeling is basically that you look at the analogy between um, blood flow through blood vessels and on the other hand, um, the electrical current through an electrical circuit. 
So if we do the derivation of the equations that we need here, they are very similar with how an electrical circuit behaves. And so that's why we can use this uh, analogy. And the nice thing is that once you have built this type of model, you can really start to play with um, how the model or the liver will behave. Uh, you can, for instance, look at um, how the liver will behave during normal blood flow. That is what you see right here on this slide. So here, for instance, we see the pressure profile throughout the liver during natural blood flow. But you can also start to play with that. So you can tune or change parameters, for instance, to go towards hypothermic machine perfusion, where we still use the same type of pressures, but we only change the perfusion fluid. So we basically don't send blood through the liver, but um, a preservation solution. In this case, it's called KPS. And then you can start playing with the pressures. And for instance, you can use lower pressures. And then going from here to here, you clearly see that the profile will drop. So here we can really start playing with the, the things um, of how the machine perfusion happens to look at what would be the optimal uh, set of parameters. And then, for instance, we saw if we did that, that using machine perfusion at lower pressures is probably more interesting and more safer to do, because then you might end up with a lower chance of developing endothelial damage, which, which is typically one of the risk factors for uh, donor livers. And here you see another example of um, these hypothermic machine perfusion um, well, in this case, it's, it's uh, experiments, because what we did next to the modeling is also performing a number of experiments in which we measured pressures and flows, both at the inlets and outlets of the liver. Um, we played also with the settings of the machine, and then we were able to compare the measurements based on the experiments with the predictions of our model. And that gave us the opportunity to also validate the modeling approach. So that was about electrical analog modeling, but um, within this project, we also used another approach called computational fluid dynamics modeling. Uh, here you see such an example in which we looked at the microcirculation. So we took out a very small sample from the liver, um, as you can see right here, as well as here. And then based on that, we used a computational fluid dynamics approach. So that means basically really modeling uh, the fluid flow in 3D using um, a finite volume approach in this case. And here, for instance, you see how the pressure drops throughout this sinusoidal um, structure. And here on top of the pressures, you also see these lines going through the sinusoids, and uh, they are in this case colored according to the velocity. And then you can start playing with uh, the knowledge, eh? the knowledge that we gathered based on the previous CFD model, really looking at sinusoids, we can kind of homogenize that knowledge and use it to also build a model of what we call a liver lobule. And a liver lobule is basically the building block of a liver. It in fact holds a number of sinusoids here between its corners and the center. So then again, you can actually start playing with your modeling to look at modeling at several length scales that we call multi-scale modeling. Then, um, so that was basically the work um, done during my PhD. And then we went further on top of that by looking at um, one of the diseases called liver cirrhosis. And this was done during uh, the PhD work of Geert Peters. And liver cirrhosis is really a disease of the liver um, in, uh, in which you yeah, are faced with uh, severe problems like you have fibrosis, a kind of scar tissue that will be formed inside your liver but also typically is this type of um, nodules, we call them regenerative nodules. And you'll immediately see if you look at this liver that also the architecture of your liver is completely disturbed, including also the vascular architecture, so including um, your blood vessels. So during this PhD work, we really try to focus on what happens during the process called cyrogenesis. So that's really the development of the disease. Because the issue is when a, a patient comes to the doctor and um, he or she has liver cirrhosis, that the disease is already in a certain stage. 
and then it's very difficult to have an idea about what happened before what was the history of the disease so that might be very important information to make a good estimation of how to treat the patient in the best way, what is the point of no return. So that's why for this work we used a rat model in which we evoked um, liver cirrhosis over the course of 18 weeks. And here you clearly see that going from a normal liver to cirrhosis, that the appearance of the liver, even macroscopically, changes drastically. Whereas here you have a really smooth um, surface of the liver, here it's really clearly visible that the surface is not smooth at all, that it's really covered with all these nodules. Then to learn more about the inner vasculature, because that was again our focus here, we used two experimental techniques. On one hand, we used again vascular corrosion casting, and on the other hand, to really focus on the microcirculation, we used a combination of uh, immunohistochemistry with uh, clearing techniques, um, and then in combination with uh, confocal laser scanning. And here you see some examples of, um, again, the microcirculation, so the largest blood vessels based on the vascular corrosion casting and micro CT scanning. And if you, for instance, look at the hepatic veins, uh, the top row represents a healthy liver and the bottom one represents a diseased liver. And here you see going from normal to diseased that the vessels for the hepatic veins seem to collapse. And that makes sense because this might in fact happen due to the presence of the, the nodules and the fact that also going towards liver cirrhosis, the tissue of the liver becomes much more stiff. On the other hand, if you look at the hepatic arteries, we see the opposite happening. The vessels seem to enlarge a bit. So there the hypothesis is that you start to see some kind of compensation mechanism between those two blood supplies to the liver. And also note that, of course, the hepatic arteries have a, a larger, um, um, have a higher pressure at the inlet compared to the, the portal veins. Then looking at the microcirculation here, um, so remember here, this was based on uh, immunohistochemistry and confocal laser scanning. So based on the scanning, we got a stack of images again, uh, based upon which we could do uh, a 3D reconstruction. And then if you just look at a, a top view of that reconstruction, you see going from healthy up to cirrhosis, you already see that the density of the sinusoids is changing drastically. Uh, here you have less functional um, blood vessels remaining compared to uh, the healthy liver. So that's clear. And then we also developed a code to do very detailed analysis uh, of these blood vessel patterns to look, for instance, at the mean radius, um, but also how tortuous they are, what the length is, so to get a better idea about these morphological characteristics. And then all of that information, um, then we did actually a collaboration with colleagues from France um, to incorporate all that information in a larger model, again, an electrical analysis analog model, but here we didn't only look at the liver, we also looked at the systemic circulation surrounding it. And then we looked at certain complications that uh, also can arise during um, liver cirrhosis, such as shunts going from the portal system directly into the venous system and basically bypassing the liver to try to um, circumvent part of the, the issues caused by cirrhosis. Okay. And that brings us to the, the second part. So now we saw organ perfusion. Now we will look at drug delivery and cancer treatment. And the first part will be presented by uh, Saar Vermees. Mm -hmm. So here we see um, Saar Vermees again, um, who will talk about a planning tool for partial nephrectomy procedures. And in fact, this um, project runs in, in a collaboration between UGent, USAID Gent and Orsi. So Saar is one of the PhD students working on this, but also uh, Peter de Bakker is um, a second student working on this problem, on this uh, project. So, okay, now I give the word to Saar. Hello, everyone. My name is Saar. I am a biomedical engineer and a PhD student of Professor Devot. In the next 10 minutes, I will explain you the project that I'm currently working on, which is creating a planning tool for robot-assisted partial nephrectomy procedures. So, first things first. What is a robot-assisted partial nephrectomy? 
Well, it is a procedure that is performed to get rid of a kidney tumour. To give you a bit of a background, these are the most important structures around the kidney. There is the aorta, which supplies blood to the organs, and the vena cava, which brings the used blood back to the heart. Bifurcations of these big vessels are the renal artery and the renal vein. These are the main vessels of the kidney. Of course, as you know, the kidney produces urine, and this is excreted via the ureter. And then, when everything goes right, you just have a kidney. But when you are unlucky, a tumor can be present in the kidney. To remove this tumor from the body, it was common practice, and it still is when a tumor is too large, to remove the entire kidney during surgery. In that case, the main vessels are clamped and the kidney is cut off. This is not a partial, but a radical nephrectomy. In this way, the tumor is no longer present in the body, but unfortunately, you lose your kidney as well. This shouldn't be a big problem, since it is possible to live with just one kidney, but in patients with tumors on both kidneys, or with a decreased renal function, it would be better to retain as much functional kidney tissue as possible. This is where the partial nephrectomy comes in. In every case possible, and often that is when tumors are small enough, a partial nephrectomy is preferred over a radical one. In that case, only the arteries that supply blood to the tumor are clamped and the tumor can be resected. Now, why is it important to only clamp the artery that perfuses the tumor? Well, if you want to cut out the tumor, you don't want the patient to lose too much blood. So, you could clamp the main renal artery and stop the blood to the entire kidney. However, Every minute the kidney is left without fresh blood is a minute in which the functionality of the kidney tissue degrades. Hence, you only want a minimal amount of healthy tissue to be affected by the clamping. The hard part here is to determine which arteries perfuse the tumor and thus which arteries should be clamped. And this is where we try to help with our research. I will show you the, diffi the difficulties that come along with a partial nephrectomy by guiding you through a case study. Okay, so um, now that you got an introduction about the work of uh, Saar Vermees in the context of kidney cancer, we can focus on a, a, sec a second uh, cancer topic in which we look at local regional drug delivery for liver cancer patients. And um, one of the techniques or treatments that they use to treat liver cancer patients who have unresectable cancer is uh, called transarterial uh, therapies such as chemoembolization or radioembolization. And what happens during these therapies is that the, um, the interventional radiologist uses a catheter and navigates that catheter as closely as possible towards the uh, tumor in the liver. Of course, navigating the catheter becomes very challenging once you enter the liver. So, of course, the easiest is to inject uh, in the proper hepatic artery entering the liver. But sometimes they can go further and, for instance, go towards the left or the right lobe of the liver. Now, the thing is, at that level, they inject particles uh, who can either carry chemotherapeutic drugs or who can be radioactive in order to treat the tumor. But the thing is um, that we're not sure what happens with the particles once they are injected inside the liver. So typically uh, the treatment is very patient dependent and some patients really respond well, while others don't. And we don't really know why. But one of our hypotheses is that the particles do not end up in the region where we want them to end up always. So that's why we also look into computational fluid dynamics modeling to better understand what happens during this treatment and also to further improve it. So for this research project uh, on which one of our PhD students is also working uh, called Tim Bomberna, we, um, well, for the first steps, we started again from casts, in this case of um, also of cirrhotic livers, but uh, recently we're also looking into using patient-specific data sets for patients that are actually being treated for hepatocellular carcinoma. So we start from a stack of 2D images of which we again create a 3D reconstruction, in this case only of the arteries because the treatment happens through the arteries as we know that the tumors are mainly fed by uh, arterial blood. Then 
coming from there, we prepare our simulation geometry. And based on that simulation geometry, we can run simulations to look at both the blood flow through the blood vessels, but also at the mass transport of the particles that are being injected. And here, these red lines that you see throughout the uh, blood vessels, they basically represent a few examples of trajectories that are being uh, followed by particles. And uh, the thing is that there are several parameters who play a very important role in this process, um, as we have seen so far during our investigations. Uh, for instance, the type of particles that you use might play a big role. Are these larger particles? Are they smaller? Um, do they have a high density or not? But also the location of injection. Eh? If you put your catheter tip, for instance, here, or you put it a little bit more downstream or even further, it will have a major effect or it can have a major effect on the distribution of your particles. And these effects will also be very patient specific. So that's also why if you think about planning a procedure for, for a specific patient, that it is probably very important to also look into that patient specific geometry of that specific uh, patient. So really aiming at personalized treatments. What we also found based on our computational results is that if you look at the cross section here, so where we basically inject the, the particles uh, and we project it here, that we can create a color map. And in this case, each color or each dot represents another catheter tip location or an injection location. And it basically means that, for instance, if you would inject here in the orange region, that your uh, particles would end up near um, one of these blood vessels. And so you can really do a very specific injection if you would be able to uh, control that position. Of course, that's quite challenging. And it's something that we want to have a further look into, but it's a very quite challenging uh, thing. Other parameters that might be easier to control is, for instance, the actual location, just um, putting the catheter a little bit more deeply into the vessel, more downstream or not. These are parameters that are more easy to um, to control. Uh, here again, you see in a, a few uh, examples of these projections, we call them particle release maps. Uh, and here, for instance, we played with the actual location, uh, going from one to three. And then you see if you compare the baseline for injection plane one with plane number two and three, you see that uh, the composition of the maps is changing. And this change will largely depend on the patient specific geometry. So that was a so that was about a modeling, but we also look at uh, validating our modeling approach with the in vitro uh, experiments. So for this specific project, we work with 3D prints of the, the liver vasculature that we prepare, and then we connect them to a perfusion circuit, as you can see right here, to measure how many particles uh, come out of each outlet in order to compare those results with the ones that we obtained computationally. So that was for liver cancer. And we also have another project running in which we look at local regional drug delivery for peritoneal carcinomatosis. And here, for instance, you see what that disease is. It's basically a bunch of small tumor nodules that you can uh, find on the peritoneal surface. And this type of cancer often arises um, as a secondary disease, for instance, um, coming from or originating from a primary cancer like uh, colon cancer or ovarian carcinoma. Um, and the way in which these tumors can be treated, um, or one of the ways that we are investigating, is intraperitoneal chemotherapy, where you basically pour the chemotherapeutic drug in the uh, cavity here, in the peritoneal cavity, so that the tumor um, the, is actually surrounded by the drug. Now, within this project, we're, on one hand, we're looking at the design of uh, new catheters to deliver the drug where it should um, be administered. But we're also looking into using our CFD modeling approaches to see if we can um, model what happens inside the liver and how the drug penetrates into the tumor. Because one of the challenges here is to get a good drug penetration into the tumor. 
So to investigate this, we uh, actually did a previous study with a complete workflow based on, uh, on mice that were injected with cancer cells so that they would grow tumors, as you can see right here. Then we did uh, several imaging, um, used MRI imaging to look both at anatomical but as well as DCE images. Um, and then basically based on this bunch of experiments, also including pressure measurements inside the tumor, we uh, used all of this to feed CFD simulations in which we could look at the drug concentration. And here you see a few examples of results coming out of these uh, simulations. Uh, here, for instance, you see the pressure profile uh, in a number of cross sections through three tumors. And you can see that the uh, uh, pressure is really high in the middle of the tumor, and then it has a quite steep drop towards the edge of the tumors. And this is really a typical profile for what we call the interstitial fluid pressure uh, in tumors. And, and based on that, we in fact, we have um, a phenomenon occurring, a convective phenomenon that tries to push the drug outwards while we actually want it to enter uh, inwards. So we have these two forces that we kind of have to balance in order to uh, try to improve this way of uh, treating these, these tumor nodules. Because the reason why we look at this intraperitoneal drug delivery is because we know that uh, intravenous chemotherapy is uh, not the best approach for this type of, of tumor nodules. So once we have the interstitial fluid pressure, as we saw on the previous slide, you can also start simulating the mass transport of the drug. Uh, and then you can look at uh, concentration profiles of the drug. And you see indeed that the drug concentration is highest at the edge of the tumor because that's the location at which we applied. And then we have a rapid decrease of the drug concentration when we go towards the middle of the tumor. And based on this, we can again start playing with our model, Let's start playing with parameters. Uh, for instance, uh, one of the treatments that they might apply to facilitate drug penetration is what we call vascular normalization therapy. And then you will see, or you would see that the drug penetration would uh, improve. So that's again, one of the um, examples in which computational modeling might really help to optimize certain treatments. Here you see another example of um, intraperitoneal drug delivery. So here we don't just um, infuse a drug with a, a catheter. No, we in fact use what we call uh, pressurized intraperitoneal aerosol chemotherapy. So here the drug is really um, aerosolized under a high pressure inside the abdominal cavity with the aim of really spreading it around um, to get an as homogeneous as possible distribution of the drug inside the cavity. So currently we're also using uh, CFD approaches to investigate this and to investigate how the drug distributes into the cavity. On the right, here you see an example of uh, also an experimental setup. It's a kind of box model, uh, which we use to do in vitro experiments and then to compare with our uh, CFD results. And then this is uh, yet another project in, uh, in this context. Here we look at the lymphatic system. And in fact, at this stage, we're mainly looking at really trying to better understand the fundamentals of the lymphatic system because there's not too much known about that, uh, especially from a modeling side of view. Um, so we first try to better understand what's happening with the lymphatic system by using uh, what we call here a poroelastic modeling approach. So here you see three lymph engines, which are basically the building blocks of the larger um, collecting lymphatic vessels. But we're also looking into models in which we um, focus on the lymphatic capillaries and how the um, fluid of the interstitial um, space surrounding these capillaries drains into the capillaries. Um, and the aim here is to also look later into uh, what we call lymphedema, eh, which is um, in fact one of the major diseases related to the lymphatic system in which uh, people might end up with swollen arms or legs. A uh, swollen arm might be, for instance, due to um, surgery that uh, a patient underwent for breast cancer in which uh, breast might be removed, but also part of, for instance, lymph nodes under the armpit. Um, so if the system is disturbed, this might lead to lymphedema. And these models might help us to better understand what happens uh, at that moment. And we're also currently working on a project in, in which we try to develop a micro pump that um, we want to be able to implant under the skin 
to help or to assist in draining the excessive fluid in uh, these patients with the lymphatic um, lymphedema. Next to that, we're also thinking about applying these models or to see if we could also do something about uh, local regional drug delivery via the lymphatic system, uh, because that's also one of the um, yeah, research um, aims that is sometimes formulated that actually the lymphatic system might also be used to do uh, drug delivery. And then to end with just a, a quick summary of other projects. And now we talked mainly about organ perfusion and then also about drug delivery and cancer treatment. But there's actually a, a diverse bunch of other projects that I'm currently looking into, like a, a planning tool for neuro interventional procedures, uh, where we start from the yeah, the vasculature of a patient specific uh, brain. And there we want to guide um, the interventional radiologist in uh, how to navigate the catheter, which is the best way to take to reach the place where you want to intervene and how to do that. But we have several other projects. Uh, for instance, here, this is a project uh, looking at uh, liver perfusion, but in the context of Fontan patients. This is a, a project together with uh, Sikits Hospital in uh, Toronto. We also have several collaborations with our um, friends from the, the veterinary department, uh, for instance, here to look in portosystemic shunts in dogs um, and so on. So it's really nice to have a multitude of, of applications in, in which we can uh, use our technique. And this kind of uh, summarizes this talk. Uh, I think we have shown that um, Using our computational biomechanics modeling techniques, you can really look at uh, several applications ranging from organ perfusion to drug delivery to cancer treatment planning and so on. And by doing that, our aim is really to uh, gather bits and, and pieces of the puzzle in order to bring computational biomechanics closer to the patient. Uh, so um, that these computational metal methods can really assist in providing a, a better or optimized treatment uh, for patients. That's it. With that, I would like to end this presentation. Okay, bye.